intelligencesquared.com. I've been told I need to. Laurie, will you just this? move the mic yes, down? Yes, yes, as always. <laughs> so that we can hear Bring you. Bring me down to size before you even start it off. All right. Um, ladies, gentlemen, and everyone else here present, my teammate, Mr. Willits, has made worthy representations for the motion, and I'm honoured to have been invited by Intelligence Squared to follow his points. Since he has been personally funded by PricewaterhouseCoopers to the tune of £70,000 in the past year to make these points, they come certified by business, and you, ladies and gentlemen, should take them seriously. <laughs> now, the framing of this debate, like the framing of the baby boomers argument as a whole, because this is something we've had um, quite a lot of the past year, deserves attention. The older generation, we're informed, has stolen the family silver. Well, what does that mean? It implies that the creation and maintenance of the welfare state in Britain, of free and popular healthcare, housing, education, out-of-work benefits, was somehow an, an indulgence, rather than the bare minimum of common inheritance that can and should be the birthright of every generation that's prepared to stand and fight for it. Yes, many of the baby boomers who were fortunate enough not to have been miners or steel workers did live through a golden age, enjoying benefits and a safety net of which their own mothers and fathers could only dream. It's sad to be living in an age when the political class seems to be doing everything in its power to make that golden age a historical aberration, rather than the baseline of building towards a truly free and equal democracy in Britain. <coughs> now, what I believe is that my parents and their generation had every right to the education and healthcare advantages that allowed them, the children of immigrants, to build satisfying and useful lives. The generation currently reaching adulthood has that right too as will our children and grandchildren, and that right is being confiscated right now, as we speak, not just by the greed of our parents, but by a government desperate to distract attention from its wholesale plundering of the public purse to finance the cannibalistic self-indulgence of a financial system whose time is done. I am aware that in speaking like this, I may be breaking the protocol of this debate. I was invited to make a polite case for why the older generation has sold out the younger for the imposing team to politely contest, presumably without too much reference to class, to the economic crisis, or to persons here present. I feel that the situation here is too urgent to pay protocol or politeness any mind. Mr Willits, you and the cabinet of which you are a, mem a member are screwing the younger generation on whose behalf you claim to speak today. The rank hypocrisy of standing here and claiming that the baby boomers have sold the family silver whilst, as we speak, an education white paper is passing through the House which will allow private companies to rifle through the pockets of all that remains of the higher education system in this country burns in the back of the throat. We're talking, let's remind ourselves, about a higher education system which disadvantaged young people are already abandoning because of the soaring costs of university which you have personally overseen. University applications are down almost 10% this year, despite your assurances that tripling tuition fees and gutting the teaching grant, grant would not make a difference to applications. Mr Willett, if you truly care about the young people of Britain, if you truly believe that the baby boomers have stolen the family shit silver and should be made to return it, you would not be doing these things. It is not the baby boomers who have stolen our future, Mr Willett, it's you. You and your government, and we will not forget it in a hurry. <laughs> Phrasing this robbery in terms of generational conflict is a clever piece of misdirection, as uh, my uh, contestant, or uh, Ms. Hauker, has already mentioned. In your book, Mr. Willits, you draw attention to the fact that the post-war generation is set to get out of the welfare state approximately 118% of what it put in, a statistic that fundamentally misunderstands what the welfare state is supposed to be about. Here's another statistic for you. The richest 10% of the population of Britain are now 100 times as wealthy as the poorest 10%. And whilst the people of this country have been suffering the fallout of public sector cuts that have seen their standard of living drop through the floor, the richest 500 members of this society have seen their wealth rise by a fifth this year. Mr Willits also draws attention, as he has several times in public forums, to the fact that the rise in social status of women, he believes, contributed of women contributed to the problems of working men. Feminism, he says, has trumped egalitarianism. More misdirection. Anyone, it seems, is to blame for rising inequality in this country. Anyone except the wealthy. 
Set the children against their parents, the women against the men. Anything to stop legitimate civil unrest as the majority of this nation realising that it has been sold off and sold out by the political and financial elite of which, of which Mr Willits himself has long been a member. A clever piece of misdirection, but not quite clever enough. As we speak, the streets of this country are full of angry people who are not fooled for a second by this muddled rhetoric about generational conflict. This is class conflict and is being waged by the wealthy against everyone else with the full support of a cabinet of millionaires who see nothing wrong, for example, in claiming hundreds from the taxpayer to charge, change the light bulbs in their second home, whilst claiming that it is the women and the over 40s who are taking the state for everything they can get. My colleague appears to expect that my generation will be fooled by this argument. Mr Willits, we are not fooled and we will not forget. I know that I was invited here to back up your case. <laughs> <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, what did you expect? How could you possibly ask me? Having seen my friends, my family and my contemporaries have their futures stolen, their dreams dashed and their life chances ruined by policy decisions which you have personally overseen, not to say, to call it how it is. To speak like this is the only possible response to the many and specific betrayals of trust and mandate enacted by the government of which my teammate is a member and by Mr Willits himself in personally presiding over the largest transfer of wealth from poor to rich, young to old, advantage to, disadvantaged to advantaged in this country in recent memory. And I hope that leaving him to back up his absurd arguments on his own will help him in some way... <laughs> will help him in some way to understand one of the few remaining lessons it may be useful for him to learn. Mr Willits, you are more alone than you think. <laughs> you and your government, and governments like it across the world, are losing the argument, just as you will probably lose this debate. <laughs> right now, as we all sit here in this beautiful hall, in this prestigious talk, to which most of you have paid to attend, Students who were involved in a peaceful protest against Mr Willett's savage university reforms in June are going through the court system. Tomorrow they may be sent to jail for no other reason than daring to speak out against the bartering off of British higher education by a political class so drenched in self-deceit that, really th that it really thinks posturing about generational conflict will stem the revulsion of the majority of people in this country. Mr Willits, I don't expect you to listen to me. I don't expect you to apologise to the audience for coming here and dissembling, nor to my generation for pretending to speak in our interests whilst mortgaging our futures to your friends in finance. But if you wish to retain a scrap of self-respect, you could start by asking that young people like me not be criminalised for having the temerity to speak against you. Thanks to you and your education reforms, millions of families who voted for you are watching their worlds get a little darker. There is no need to cement that betrayal with cowardice. Thank you. Go on, ask me questions. Well, me first. Lucky you're on my side. I dread think what you'd have said if you're against me. <laughs> well, well, I asked for contentiousness, and we certainly got it. I'd just like to ask Laurie, do you hold David personally responsible, having been in office for the last 18 months, for everything that's gone wrong with inequality in Britain in the past couple of decades? No, obviously that would be facetious. There's a long trajectory of, um, of, of this kind of thing in government. But um, the fact that Mr Willits has wrote, written a book um, arguing that, you know, that, that in favour of the younger generation was personally presiding over various educational reforms which are, kind of, which are cheating young people out of what he claims is their inheritance, I find the hypocrisy rank. Thank well, you. you know, I think in the circumstances, I think going to ask David whether he'd like to put a question <laughs> to you first, even though he's on your side. Well, um, I, I, I mean, some disagreement with the, my fellow teammate in this debate. Uh, just on this, on this specific thing, let me just go back then to what we're doing on higher education. At the moment, if you leave university, you start paying back for the cost of your education if you're earning more than £15,000 a year, which means that people in their 20s and early 30s, when they're trying to uh, get started and perhaps buy their first flat, face very heavy financial pressures. What we are doing is saying that people should only start paying back when they're earning more than £21,000 a year. So we're actually lowering the monthly repayments. And as I said earlier, 
I know these proposals are controversial. We would have been far less controversial if we just sliced away at the amount of money going into universities to pay for a young person's education. We wouldn't have had protests in Parliament Square if we'd done that. But that would have been to let down the younger generation because they'd have had a poorer quality university experience. What we're saying is when people earning more than £21,000 are in those circumstances, that point they should pay back. And I'd have thought you'd have regarded that as quite a progressive tax policy, actually, Laurie. I, think, I can't think of many more fair and progressive ways of financing university education. Well, the thing you leave out, um, Mr Willits, is that it's not a choice between uh, raising student fees or slashing the, uh, the grant to universities. You have, in fact, done both. Um, and the fact that it's not a choice between making cuts to universities in one way and making cuts to universities in another, in another way. You don't have to make cuts to universities at all. The total cuts oh. to universities being made at the moment are less than the subsidy being granted to one major bank in this country. There is a choice being made here. It is not inevitable that money has to be taken away from universities, from education, from welfare, Larry, from health. a very quick response from David. Well, because we, we, well we, because... I mean, as Alistair Darling says in his memoirs, the outgoing Labour government realised that the public finances were unsustainable. We actually inherited a commitment no. from the previous government to cut £600 million from higher education and the science budget. We then looked for the least damaging way in which money could be saved. And I continue to believe that expecting graduates earning more than 21000 to pay for their higher education is a far better deal for the younger generation than a reduction in the support per okay. student at university or reduction in student numbers. Thank uh, you. Ed, uh, what question would you like to put to Laurie? Um, well, Very quickly. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, uh, the thing is that, I mean, and the hopes are stolen, the dreams are dashed and everything, and, and it is very bad, <laughs> don't get me wrong. Um, <laughs> Look, it's, it's quite bad. Job. But you probably don't feel it. But I, I, think it would, well, I think it would be... Um, well, I've written a book about it, in fairness, so I, mean, I, I think it's difficult for you to make that case. But um, I, I think this, this point would be stronger... Uh, st more strongly made if David Willis wasn't such an amazingly kindly and generous <laughs> man. Um, but, but there actually is a very serious point here, which is that um, the, the argument that you assert is one which is kind of a priori about rich and poor. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that, I mean, actually to go anywhere near supporting this motion, you have to make a case that there is a demographic element to this. And actually, the case is quite strong. I mean, I was quite convinced by what David Willits had to say, actually. Um, I mean, it's, you know, clearly demographics do create massive um, structural problems for, uh, for different generations. Um, I mean, do you still feel that it's political responsibility that ultimately uh, should take account of this rather than the fact that there's a large number of people? Um, well, uh, demographics are very interesting when you look at class because um, what the, uh, the coming austerity programs in Britain and across the world are doing is they are obviously the people who will, who will benefit least from the fallout of that are people who are poor. People who are poor happen in vast numbers to be young. It's not the other way around. It's an, it, this is an accident of demographics that quite a lot of the people who suffer from this fallout will be young. Not only is it an accident of demographics, it's an act accident of demographics which is not just a kind of gradual, gradual shift you know, from the older generation to the younger generation. This is, a, this is a decision which is being deliberately taken and we have to remember that that's the case. This is not, this is not something, you know, people are not sitting there going, oh, how can we screw over the younger generation? This is something that's much deeper. Like Ed says, it's ideological. It's about, it's about, a, free mar it's about a free market program which believes, that, um, which believes that, f that taking away things like welfare, healthcare, handing over education to the private system is ultimately in the interests of everyone. And it's wrong. It's simply wrong. Laurie, thank you. For